This is a part two to a video I previously made covering forgotten rally cars. If you believe a car that should rightfully have been featured in this video wasn't, perhaps you may find it in part one, link in the description below. Without further ado, here are some more forgotten rally cars. Last time I delved into Mazda's rallying career and the small amount of success that it experienced over its approximately 15 year long campaign. However, there is another Japanese brand that has attempted to capture the W over a much longer period of time, and that is Nissan, which also covers the endeavours of Datsun. In fact, throughout the early years, Datsun would be at the helm of Nissan in rally, and saw most of the company's success in this area. Of course, the iconic Datsun 240Z would be known to take on many a rally throughout the 1970s. In particular, it had a knack for conquering the Safari Rally in Africa. It would first enter the rally in the 1971 season and immediately came out on top, winning the overall victory, the class victory and the team victory. However, with the Z being both heavier and less powerful than many other rally cars of the time, its victories outside of this were much more inconsistent. The only WRC event victory it ever saw was at the 1973 Safari Rally. Nissan's next big endeavour would build on this Safari success with the Violet. It managed to win the Safari Rally four years in a row from 1979 to 1982 in the hands of Kenyan driver Shekhar Mehta, outspeeding the big boys considerably. It raced under both the 160J and the GT guises, the latter making about 220 horsepower from a 2 litre engine. Nissan's next big step came at the arrival of Group B. The Silvia 240 RS was introduced in 1983 and was effectively a direct evolution of the Violet. Changes included larger flares, a wider track, lighter body parts and a power increase of up to 265 horses. Unlike many rally cars that would soon appear under Group B, the 240 RS sacrificed outright speed and technological superiority for unbeatable reliability and ruggedness. However, unlike its predecessors, the 240 RS would never see a WRC win, its best result being a second at the 1983 Rally New Zealand. It would, however, go on to see some good use in national championships in the likes of Britain, Kenya and Greece. Plus, with its lower price point and excellent reliability, the 240 RS was very popular with small privateer teams. It may not match the true greatness of other Group B machines, but it makes for a great little underdog. Nissan's final push to success in rally would come in the 1990s. From 1990 to 1994, Nissan would produce the Pulsar GTIR for homologation into the Group A World Rally Championship. Featuring a turbocharged 2 litre 4 banger producing 227 horsepower, being combined with Nissan's Atessa four wheel drive system, it looked to be a promising new toy for the team. The competition version debuted in 1991, producing almost 300 horsepower. However, its career was not filled with success. And with only nine rallies completed, the Nissan rally team withdrew the car at the end of 1992 without seeing any wins. There were a multitude of factors that likely led to its demise, including some poor design choices for a rally car, cultural differences between the company and the factory team, and investment wanting to be redirected into the R390 Le Mans project. The best it ever placed was third at the 1992 Swedish rally, but that doesn't mean the GTIR is a bad car, it's actually rather cool. Now pretty much everyone knows about the Mitsubishi Lancer Evo in rallying, its start in the early 1990s, to its dominance with Tommy Mackinnon in the late 1990s, to its slow fade into obscurity throughout the 2000s. Well, it wasn't an uncommon sight to see these saloons being campaigned under a name that wasn't Mitsubishi. Throughout the late 1990s, Mitsubishi were dominating not only in the World Rally Championship, but also the Production World Rally Championship. Essentially, the WRC just raced over fewer rounds and with cars that were completely stock. From 1995 to 2001, the Mitsubishi Lancer Evo would win the Production World Rally Championship, and in many of those years, the Evo would take up the entire podium. In 2002, however, the Malaysian brand Proton wanted a slice of this successful pie. 
however, they decided to take a shortcut. Proton and Mitsubishi actually had a fairly close relationship, the Japanese manufacturer helping Proton develop their first model back in 1985, and Proton would again take advantage of this partnership. They would license out the Lancer Evo 6, slap their badge on it, and send it on their way in the hands of Malaysian driver Karamjit Singh and his co-driver Alan O. And despite the Evo 6, or in this guise the Proton Pert, actually being fairly dated by 2002, they won, ahead of drivers who were piloting the more advanced Lancer Evo 7. It would win in Cyprus and at the Safari, as well as taking up a number of other podiums. The car even saw a couple of top 10s across all classes, meaning that this stock rebadged Evo was beating actual WRC cars. In the end, the Proton Pert would take its first and only PWRC title in the 2002 season. Not bad at all. And now we take a trip back in time to Group B. While most cars from this era, including the aforementioned Nissan Silvia 240RS, have gained a cult following in the almost four decades since Group B was abolished, there are some manufacturers that simply never saw much success at all during this time. One such manufacturer would be Citroen. Unlike their utter domination of the sport during the 2000s, Group B was almost entirely a failure for them. Their initial effort came in 1981, and was inspired by the success of French rival Renault and their mid-engine 5 turbo. Citroen wanted a version of their own. Among many prototypes, the most major outcome of this would be a Citroen Visa body fitted atop the chassis and engine of a Lotus's Spree of all things, as the two companies would initially collaborate. However, poor ground clearance, less than strong bodywork and unpredictable handling quickly put an end to this car's career, with the help of the roaring success of the Audi Quattro and its all-wheel drive system. Citroen therefore took the Visa and applied their newfound knowledge and more upgrades. In the end, after a few years of testing and competing with a few different front-wheel drive versions of the Visa, the ultimate result would be the Visa 1000 Pistes, fitted with a 1.4 litre engine making around 110 horsepower and connected to a four-wheel drive system to go into competition for the 1984 season. Due to it being smaller and less powerful, it was never going to be able to tango with the top dogs, though it did wrangle a 9th place finish at the 1984 Rally Portugal, and even an 8th at the 1985 Rally Monte Carlo. However, it was around this time that Citroen wanted to go for the title with a top class entry. This time around, they decided to go with the much larger Citroen BX as their basis, and numerous prototypes would begin emerging, some front-wheel drive, some four-wheel drive, and with power ranging up to anything as high as 300 horsepower. By 1985, the team had created the final outcome of this testing period, the Citroen BX4TC. While possessing a name very in keeping with the monstrous nature of Group B, the car itself was not. Most manufacturers taking part in Group B would push the absolute limits of the rulebook, creating cars that may look like their road going counterparts on the outside, but underneath they were anything but, with a lot of them featuring specially manufactured parts. The BX40C by contrast was much more domesticated, with a lot of its components simply being fished out of whatever bin the team could get their hands on, likely due to the fact that they had a much smaller budget than the status quo. Despite possessing a 2.1 litre turbocharged engine producing 380 horsepower, rather like its German rival, the Quattro, the BX40C had one major fault – weight. Despite the class minimum weight being just 960 kilograms, the BX40C tipped the scales at a whopping 1,150 kilograms. Add to that the fact that many mechanical components were years old at this point, it was front engined at rarity in the top class of Group B, and that the front of the car had to be elongated to accommodate the longitudinally mounted engine, and before it even reached the starting line, the BX40C was pretty much doomed to fail. Even at its first event, the 1986 Monte Carlo Rally, both Citroens would retire, one due to a crash due to poor handling, and one due to mechanical failure. In fact, the best the car would ever place would be sick at the following round in Sweden, though still far behind most of the other top class racers. Citroen would, not long after, pull the BX40C from competition entirely, 
foreseeing that the car would likely not accumulate any notable success while continuing to eat up money. While Citroen's endeavours into Group B may be perceived as an embarrassment, that sentiment apparently extending to Citroen themselves, who supposedly disassembled many examples of the BX40C after the fact, the eventual demise of Group B not long after, and their soon to be success in the WRC, likely dampened the blow of it. The final car I would like to look at today is from a little brand called Seat. They have had some concrete involvement in rally sport over the years, such as the 124 Sport they raced briefly in the 1970s, the outrageous twin-engine Dibetha bimotor prototype intended for use in the Cancel Group S Championship, and most important of all, the Seat Ibiza kit car, which took part in the FIA 2 Litre Cup, a subclass of the WRC in the 1990s. The car would bring home a hat-trick in this championship from 1996 to 1998. The team's success with the Ibiza kit car provided reason enough for Volkswagen, the owners of Seat, to give the green light for Seat to take a step up to the top level of the WRC and try their luck there. The Seat Cordoba WRC would be the result, a homologated version of the Cordoba 16 valve. Like other WRC rivals of the time, it featured a fairly standard 2-litre turbocharged engine with full-time four-wheel drive and active differentials. It would debut at the start of the 1998 season. Essentially, 1998 and 1999 were to be Seat's time for testing and to get the car perfected. The title push would come in 2000 onwards. In 1999, the Cordoba WRC Evo 2 would debut, featuring aerodynamic and cooling improvements, and the team would pick up a third place in New Zealand in the hands of Tony Gardemeister, as well as in Great Britain. With most of the major kinks ironed out, Seat recruited ex-world champion Didier Auriol as their top driver for the 2000 season, with high hopes of a good team performance, as he was just one of multiple highly skilled pilots. They would also debut the Evo 3 this year, featuring slight aerodynamic improvements. Despite everything looking to be in place for the team, what was supposed to be a fight for the trophy this year ended up not really panning out. Reliability issues plagued the team throughout the season, and in conjunction with a few accidents, the team managed just one podium throughout the season, finishing a rather dismal fifth overall. It's also worth noting that the car's short wheelbase, and the position of the engine being rather more forward and higher up than its rivals, certainly didn't help with performance. But it then got worse, as Seat announced they would be leaving the sport by the end of the season, likely due to the poor results, the restructuring of Seat Sport, and the replacement of Seat CEO. It's also worth noting that Skoda, another manufacturer owned by the Volkswagen Group, joined the WRC in 1999. Volkswagen likely didn't want two of its brands eating into their WRC budget, and so one would have to go. I do believe Seat could have seen some success had their campaign continued, whether they endured with the Cordoba WRC or another model. Seat has not since been seen taking part in the WRC. So, what was your favourite forgotten rally car mentioned in this video? Obviously, there are still numerous forgotten rally cars to cover. One set of cars that was heavily requested were the F2 kit cars of the 1990s, which I briefly mentioned with the Seat Ibiza kit car. While these are each interesting in their own right, I felt a fully dedicated video covering the championship would be more fitting. Coming soon. Thank you so much for watching, with a very special thanks to Ben Wright and Brum Brum Brin, who are very generously donating at the highest tier on my Patreon. Just £1 a month is an amazing help, and I also have active socials, which are linked in the description below. Again, thank you for watching, and take care.